Philip Watson provides an insightful exploration of the origins and subsequent history of Martin Luther's commentary on the Epistle to the Galatians, emphasizing its foundational role in the Protestant Reformation's theological discourse. This seminal work, initially delivered as a series of lectures at the University of Wittenberg in 1531, where Luther served as a professor of biblical exegesis for over three decades, is not merely a product of Luther's academic endeavors, but also a testament to the collaborative spirit of his time. Luther, known for his dynamic lecturing style, relied on a brief yet meticulously prepared outline rather than fully scripted texts, embodying a direct and engaging approach to teaching. The preservation and dissemination of Luther's commentary owe much to the diligent efforts of George Rohrer, Veit Dietrich, and Caspar Krusiger, Luther's contemporaries who meticulously transcribed his lectures. Rohrer, in particular, played a pivotal role, taking extensive notes in a unique abbreviated script, which formed the backbone of the commentary's first published edition. The collaboration among these scholars was crucial in ensuring the accuracy and fidelity of Luther's insights to the printed text. The process from lecture to publication was intricate and reflective of the era's commitment to scholarly endeavor. After the lectures concluded in December 1531, Rohrer undertook the task of meticulously writing out Luther's spoken words, consulting with Dietrich and Krusiger to ensure the integrity of the transcription. This collaborative effort culminated in the commentary's publication in 1535, followed by subsequent editions that further refined and disseminated Luther's theological insights. The English translations of Luther's commentary, beginning in 1575, further illustrate its enduring influence. These editions, particularly the Middleton edition of 1807, which included a biographical sketch of Luther by Erasmus Middleton, played a significant role in making Luther's thoughts accessible to a broader audience. The commentary's journey from a series of lectures to a widely read and influential text accentuates not only Luther's profound impact on theological scholarship, but also the collective endeavor of those who were instrumental in preserving and sharing his legacy. Moreover, Watson offers a comprehensive view into the intricacies of translating Martin Luther's robust and theologically dense Latin into English, this particular edition leverages an original Middleton copy and a 1616 black letter edition as its primary sources, meticulously comparing the entire text to the original Latin to ensure accuracy and fidelity. The editorial team faced a significant challenge. How to modernize Luther's language without diluting its original potency and spirit, a task deemed both costly and extensive were a completely new translation to be undertaken. Watson affirms the Elizabethan translator's dedication to preserving the essence of Luther's work. These translators, whose identities remain deliberately anonymous, possessed a deep respect for Luther's theological insights, yet were influenced by Zwinglian sympathies. This bias is subtly evident in their selective omissions of Luther's commentary, particularly concerning sacramental doctrine, where Luther's views diverged from those of the Swiss reformer Zwingli. These omissions were not limited to doctrinal differences, but extended to grammatical and philological nuances, as well as references to previous commentators, suggesting a complex editorial process that balanced respect for Luther's original text with the translator's theological leanings. Furthermore, the introduction discusses the editorial decision to provide a fresh translation of Luther's preface, aiming to render it into modern speech as faithfully as possible without resorting to pure paraphrase, this effort asserts the edition's goal of making Luther's insights accessible to contemporary readers while maintaining the stylistic and spiritual essence of the 16th century text. Watson's narrative sheds light on the delicate balance between historical fidelity and the need to engage modern readers, revealing the nuanced challenges of bringing Luther's enduring theological legacy to a new audience. In addition, Watson delves into the intricate task of translating and interpreting Martin Luther's commentary on the epistle to the Galatians for the English reader, highlighting the delicate balance between staying true to Luther's original message and ensuring the translation's relevance and clarity. The Elizabethan translators, Watson notes, managed to faithfully capture Luther's voice, carefully correcting errors and omissions without straying from Luther's intended meaning. This approach often involved retaining explanatory notes within square brackets to bridge any gaps between Luther's time and contemporary understanding, rather than altering the original text significantly. 
Watson indicates the significance of using the second edition of Luther's work as the basis for the English version, maintaining that Luther himself had revised it to enhance the clarity and effectiveness of his arguments. These revisions, made with Luther's approval, included stylistic improvements and the addition of subtitles to guide the reader through the text, ensuring that the translation reflected Luther's mature theological stance. The personal importance of the Epistle to the Galatians for Luther is also a focal point in Watson's analysis. Luther viewed this epistle as central to his theological convictions and reformative efforts, affectionately comparing it to his own spouse, Katie von Bora. Over time, Luther distanced himself from earlier commentaries, influenced by St. Jerome and Erasmus, developing a more critical and independent exegesis that reiterated his deepening understanding of Christian doctrine and his commitment to reform. Watson's examination of Luther's work on Galatians not only sheds light on the complexities of translating theological texts, but also captures the dynamic nature of Luther's thought and the enduring impact of his teachings on Protestant theology. Through careful analysis, Watson portrays Luther as a figure constantly engaged with the core tenets of Christianity, striving to make them accessible and relevant to his contemporaries. Further, Watson's examination of Martin Luther's renewed focus on the Epistle to the Galatians in 1531 uncovers Luther's intent to repeat the doctrine of justification by faith amidst the theological controversies of his time. This period in Luther's life was marked by simultaneous conflicts with both radical reformers and traditional scholastic theology, including papal authority. Luther's adversaries were diverse, ranging from radicals like Munzer, Puritans like Karlstadt, to mystic rationalists like Schwenkfeld and Frank, all of whom sought various reforms that diverged from Luther's own vision. Luther termed the radical reformers enthusiasts or schwarmerei, criticizing them for their perceived spiritual arrogance and emphasis on direct personal experiences of the spirit over traditional ecclesiastical practices. This group, though internally diverse, shared a common dissatisfaction with Luther's reformative approach, particularly his adherence to sacraments and the written word as essential elements of faith. Luther's main contention with the enthusiasts was their undervaluation of external religious practices, such as sacraments and the Bible, in favor of an internal, subjective, spiritual experience. He contended that this perspective overlooked the crucial role of external means in mediating divine truths and facilitating a comprehensive Christian faith. Luther maintained that the Spirit's operation did not exclude the use of outward religious forms, but was integrally connected to them, thus advocating for a balanced view that upheld the significance of both the inward experience of faith and its outward expressions. Watson's narrative sheds light on Luther's theological battles, underlining his efforts to defend the complexity of Christian faith against simplifications that either disregarded the spiritual importance of external religious forms or dismissed the necessity of a personal, inward relationship with God. Through this lens, Luther's stance emerges as a pivotal contribution to Protestant theology, advocating for a nuanced understanding of faith that bridges the gap between personal spirituality and communal religious practice. Besides, Watson's exploration into Martin Luther's theological stance reveals a serious engagement with the scriptures, particularly in response to the enthusiast's interpretation. The enthusiast sought a direct personal experience of God, underscoring spiritual over literal understanding of the Bible, often quoting verses like 2 Corinthians 3, 6 and John 6, 63 to bolster their argument. However, Luther's counterargument was rooted in a contextual and comprehensive reading of Scripture, which he believed clearly refuted the enthusiast's claims. Luther debated that the Apostle Paul's discussions on the letter versus the Spirit were not dismissals of the written word or endorsements of an allegorical interpretation over a literal one. Instead, Luther saw these distinctions as clarifications between the law and the gospel, which could both be communicated through writing and speech without losing their spiritual essence. He believed that the term flesh didn't merely refer to the physical or external, but included anything emanating from human nature without the Holy Spirit's influence, in contrast, spirit or spiritual referred to all that originates from the Holy Spirit, regardless of physical manifestation.
This theological viewpoint led Luther to consider even the incarnate Christ's flesh as spiritual, challenging the enthusiast's limited understanding of flesh and spirit. Luther's nuanced approach reveals that while he occasionally sounded like an enthusiast in emphasizing the Holy Spirit's role in understanding God's Word, his overall theology firmly upheld the value of the external written word. Watson accentuates Luther's belief that a true spiritual understanding does not eschew the written word, but sees it as integral to the Holy Spirit's revelation, marrying the letter and the spirit in a unified conception of faith and scripture. This elucidation affirms Luther's enduring commitment to a balanced and holistic approach to biblical interpretation. Additionally, Watson sheds light on the thorough divergence between Martin Luther's views on the Holy Spirit and those of the enthusiasts, a group to which Thomas Munzer belonged. Watson critiques Monsignor Ronald Knox for his portrayal of Luther's opposition to Munzer as based on a mystical creed, suggesting Knox overlooks a critical distinction. Luther's understanding of the Holy Spirit's workings through the Word of God contrasting sharply with the enthusiast's belief in its direct impartation without need for scripture or external mediation. Watson asserts Luther's firm belief in the necessity of scripture as the vehicle for the Holy Spirit's communication with humanity. According to Luther, detaching from the Word equates to forsaking the true Holy Spirit, inadvertently welcoming deception. This perspective wasn't merely a rebuttal to the enthusiasts, but a cornerstone of Luther's theology, advocating for Scripture's supremacy and its role as the primary interpreter of divine will. Luther's theological battles extended beyond the enthusiasts to the Roman Catholic Church, challenging the Church's claim to exclusive interpretive authority over the Bible. He disputed that both the enthusiasts and the papacy fundamentally erred by placing human insight above scriptural authority, undermining the Bible's central role in revealing God's truth. Through Watson's analysis, it becomes clear that Luther's advocacy for the Scripture as the conduit for the Holy Spirit was not only a defense against external misinterpretations, but also an affirmation of his theological vision. This vision highlighted the Word of God as the indispensable mediator between the divine and the human, a principle that defined his reformative efforts and left a lasting impact on Christian theology. Also, Watson centers on Martin Luther's confrontations with two principal adversaries, the enthusiasts and the papacy, both of whom Luther accused of misinterpreting the source of divine revelation. The enthusiasts, according to Luther, claimed direct access to the Holy Spirit bypassing the scriptures and subjected the biblical text to their personal interpretations, reminiscent of the approach taken by figures like Thomas Munzer, this subjective interpretation, Luther contended, led them away from the true understanding of God's word. In contrast, the papacy indicated that the Pope's declarations were inherently imbued with spiritual authority, even when they deviated from or contradicted scripture. Luther equated this stance with enthusiasm, criticizing it as a departure from the external objective word of God to rely on internal or institutional assertions deemed spiritual. Watson maintains Luther's firm belief in the Word of God as the primary medium through which the Spirit operates, a belief that starkly contrasts with the positions of his opponents. This divergence underpins Luther's theological framework, particularly his doctrine of justification by faith alone, which insists on the Scripture as the living expression of God's Spirit and the ultimate authority in matters of faith. The historical significance of Luther's debate, as Watson outlines, is not merely an ecclesiastical dispute, but a foundational struggle over the locus of divine authority and revelation. The commentary on Galatians, first English edition published in 1575, is lauded for its ability to convey the essence of Paul's teachings and Luther's interpretive zeal. Watson portrays this work as a critical resource for understanding the dynamics of Luther's reformative arguments and their enduring impact on Christian theology pointing out its value for both historical and spiritual enlightenment. Moreover, Watson offers a weighty roadmap for engaging with this pivotal New Testament book. He posits that a comprehensive and sequential reading is crucial to grasp the apostolic message fully. Watson delineates the necessity of viewing the text as a cohesive whole, urging readers to interconnect various sections to unveil the Apostle Paul's nuanced stance on the relationship between faith, works, and the law. This approach aids in discerning Paul's delicate balance. 
advocating for justification through faith in Jesus Christ alone, devoid of legalistic conditions, while simultaneously not diminishing the significance of good works as expressions of faithful obedience. Furthermore, Watson reiterates the importance of the reader's disposition towards the text, advocating for an empathetic alignment with Paul's spiritual and pastoral intent. He suggests that the most profound insights from Galatians are reserved for those who approach the text with a heart shaped by spiritual struggle, humility, and a yearning for divine guidance. This counsel reflects a deep understanding of the text's capacity to offer solace and direction, particularly to those burdened by spiritual turmoil. In addition, Watson's reflection is enriched by historical testimonies, such as John Bunyan's veneration of Martin Luther's commentary on Galatians. Bunyan's personal testament to the transformative power of Luther's work on his own spiritual journey repeats the enduring relevance and impact of Galatians across generations. It underlines the epistle's unique ability to speak directly to the human condition, offering hope and clarity to those navigating the complexities of faith and obedience. Watson's insights into Galatians not only offer a guide for engaging with the text, but also invite readers into a deeper spiritual journey. By advocating for a holistic reading and a heart open to transformation, Watson bridges historical context and contemporary faith practice, illustrating Galatians' lasting power to inspire, convict, and comfort. Further, in 1738, a momentous encounter with Martin Luther's commentary on the Epistle to the Galatians sparked a deep spiritual transformation in the lives of Charles and John Wesley, founders of Methodism. This episode began when William Holland, having returned to London from America, introduced Charles Wesley to Luther's work. The reading of Luther's preface, underscoring justification by faith alone, elicited an overwhelming sense of peace and liberation in Charles and his companions marking a significant spiritual awakening. Charles Wesley's journal reflects on this experience with astonishment, recognizing the doctrine of justification by faith alone as foundational, yet neglected within the church's teachings. He committed to disseminating this crucial understanding among his circle, emphasizing that genuine faith is not passive but active in love, good works and holiness. This revelation led to Charles Wesley's evangelical conversion on Whit Sunday, experiencing the very essence of faith he had intellectually embraced. John Wesley, too, encountered a similar spiritual enlightenment, initially influenced by Luther's preface to the Epistle to the Romans. However, John's subsequent engagement with Luther's commentary on Galatians three years later yielded a stark contrast in reception. Critiquing the commentary for its mysticism, perceived disregard for reason and disparagement of good works and divine law, John Wesley expressed deep concern over the theological direction advocated by Luther, associating these views with what he considered doctrinal errors within the Moravian Church. This critical period in the Wesley brothers' lives not only shaped their theological perspectives, but also contributed significantly to the development of Methodist doctrine. It accentuates the dynamic and sometimes contentious journey of faith exploration, affirming the importance of a balanced integration of faith, grace, and works in Christian practice and belief. Besides, Watson's analysis dives into the theological discourse between John Wesley and Martin Luther, with a particular focus on their divergent views on sanctification and justification. Wesley's critique of Luther, particularly his interpretation of Galatians, stems from what Wesley perceives as a gap in Luther's understanding of sanctification. However, Watson suggests that Wesley's judgment may have been clouded by his own biases, influenced by his contemporaneous theological struggles with the Moravians, whose teachings he found to be antinomian and quietistic. Watson asserts that Luther's primary concern during his 1531 lectures on Galatians was combating legalism, echoing the Apostle Paul's original challenges rather than antinomianism, which only became a significant issue for Luther around 1536, due to the radical views of Johannes Agricola. Luther's response to these challenges is evident in his vigorous opposition to antinomianism, articulated in his preface to the second edition of his commentary on Galatians and his theses against the antinomians. In these works, Luther maintains that his critique targets not the law or works per se, but their legalistic interpretation and misuse. Luther's condemnation of human reason and legalistic righteousness, as Watson highlights, is a critique of the innate human inclination towards self-justification. 
This critique forms the core of Luther's commentary on Galatians, aiming to expose and remedy this universal plague through the doctrine of justification by faith. Faith for Luther is not passive, but actively works through love, steering believers from self-centeredness towards a life centered on Christ and God. Watson debates that Luther's interpretation remains highly relevant, offering timeless insights into the struggle against self-righteousness and indicating faith's role in spiritual transformation. Despite potential discrepancies with modern scholarship, Luther's engagement with Pauline texts is celebrated for its depth and its capture of the Apostle's spirit, making his commentary on Galatians a critical resource for understanding the essence of Christian faith and practice. Additionally, Martin Luther, in his serious contemplation on his lectures on St. Paul's epistle to the Galatians, expresses astonishment at the volume of his own words, yet acknowledges the fidelity of his recorded ideas to his deepest theological convictions. At the heart of Luther's spiritual and intellectual pursuit lies the doctrine of justification by faith in Christ, a principle he holds paramount. This doctrine posits that salvation is not earned by human efforts but is a gift through faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Luther's humility surfaces as he considers his commentary on such a significant apostle's work to be merely scratching the surface of a vast divine wisdom. Driven by a sense of urgency, Luther sets aside his personal reservations to address what he perceives as a dire threat to the core truth of Christianity, the widespread misinterpretation and attack on the concept of justification by faith. He views this misinterpretation as an affront to the gospel, necessitating a bold, unashamed proclamation of the truth. Luther traces the historical challenge to this doctrine back to the very origins of sin. Maintaining Satan's deception of Adam and Eve and the subsequent lineage of disbelief, epitomized by Cain's murder of Abel. This pattern of opposition to faith, he notes, extends through human history manifesting in various cultures and religions futile attempts to achieve divine favor through their deeds apart from Christ. The rejection of God's grace in favor of self-righteousness reaches its zenith with the people of Israel, according to Luther. Despite their unique relationship with God, Evidenced by divine promises, laws, and prophetic guidance, they fell prey to self-justification, culminating in the rejection and crucifixion of Jesus Christ, the promised Messiah. Luther sees this not merely as a historical recounting, but as a perennial struggle against the truth of salvation by grace through faith, a struggle that underpins his theological reflection and fervent advocacy for the doctrine of justification by faith in Christ. Also, in his trenchant critique, Luther digs into the thorough dissonance within the Christian church, particularly spotlighting the Gentile congregations in contrast to the Jewish community's actions. Luther leverages St. Paul's observations to reiterate a paradox. Whereas the Jews, in ignorance, crucified Jesus, the Gentile church's betrayal is depicted as more egregious. Despite openly acknowledging Christ as the Son of God and the source of righteousness, there exists a stark contradiction within the Gentile church, where proclaimed believers persecute true adherents of Christ's teachings. This duplicity is likened to the biblical narrative of Cain and Abel, symbolizing a betrayal that transcends mere denial into the realm of treachery. Luther casts the contemporary church's situation in dire terms, suggesting that Christ is mocked and reduced to a mere fable within circles that should be his sanctuaries, such as Rome and broader Italy. This mockery, he disputes, is even more disdainful than the Jewish misunderstanding of Jesus as a criminal, indicating a deeper spiritual malaise. The urgency to counteract Satan's machinations is a central theme in Luther's discourse. He portrays a scenario where Satan, sensing his impending doom with the approach of Judgment Day, lashes out in desperation. This is manifested in the emergence of sects like the Anabaptists, viewed by Luther as catastrophic upheavals aimed at the church's very heart. Luther's intent is to fortify the faithful against such corruption and to reaffirm the true essence of Christianity. He appeals to the troubled, afflicted and tempted within the church, encouraging resilience against the pervasive deceit. His commentary serves as a clarion call to reject the superficial piety promoted by corrupt church officials and to embrace a more authentic Christ-centered faith. This, Luther posits, is the antidote to the spiritual crisis engulfing the church, offering a path to redemption amidst widespread moral and doctrinal decay. 
Moreover, Luther in his critique targets the core theological misunderstanding shared by Papists and Anabaptists, despite their apparent doctrinal differences. He accuses them of holding a common but flawed belief. The efficacy of God's works, notably sacraments like baptism, hinges on human worthiness. This standpoint, Luther argues, absurdly implies that if the sanctity of baptism is nullified by human sinfulness, then all of God's creations, including natural phenomena and human life itself, lose their divine significance for the ungodly. This logic, taken to its extreme, would question the legitimacy of existence and property for those not baptized under specific beliefs. Luther uses hyperbole to repeat the absurdity of the Anabaptist position, suggesting that following their logic, their very bodies, souls and inheritances would be illegitimate due to their unbaptized status. He extends this critique to papists who similarly prioritize human actions over divine grace, undermining the central Christian tenet that salvation and righteousness are found solely in Christ. In subsequent paragraphs added in later editions, Luther reflects on the relentless emergence of heresies, attributing their proliferation to Satan's influence. He specifically condemns a new sect advocating for the removal of the Ten Commandments from Christian teaching, underlining the law's role in convicting the unrepentant. Luther contends that the law and grace are not mutually exclusive, the former convicts of sin driving humanity towards the redemptive grace offered through Christ. Through this discourse, Luther underscores the importance of Christ as the foundation of Christian faith and practice, criticizing any doctrine that detracts from this focus. He advocates for a unified church that upholds the gospel's purity, emphasizing salvation through grace alone, faith alone, in Christ alone, as opposed to the worthiness or works of individuals. Furthermore, Luther's exposition on the Epistle to the Galatians serves as a robust defense and affirmation of the core Christian doctrine of justification by faith alone, set against the backdrop of a continuous spiritual warfare between the gospel of Christ and the forces of legalism, human tradition, and heretical beliefs. In his passionate discourse, Luther accentuates the Apostle Paul's warning about the inevitability of heresies as a divine mechanism to test the fidelity and discernment of the faithful. Such trials, according to Luther, are not mere impediments but pivotal moments that distinguish true believers from those swayed by erroneous teachings. He posits these challenges as opportunities for Christians to demonstrate their unwavering commitment to the gospel, echoing the biblical narrative of the perpetual enmity between the offspring of the woman and the serpent, symbolizing the struggle between good and evil. Luther's primary concern is the preservation of the gospel's purity, fearing the insidious creep of works righteousness back into the church's doctrine, thereby obscuring the grace of God as the sole means of salvation. He differentiates between various forms of righteousness, political, ceremonial, and mosaic law, and affirms the superiority and uniqueness of Christian righteousness that is founded on grace and faith, not on human deeds or observances. His call to continual engagement with the doctrine of grace asserts a deep awareness of the human propensity to drift away from foundational truths under the relentless assault of Satan the world and the inherent sinfulness of the human condition. Luther sees the teaching and rehearing of the gospel as critical to sustaining the believer's faith, making his exposition not merely an academic exercise but a vital pastoral endeavor to fortify the church against the erosion of its most precious belief, salvation through faith in Christ alone. In this light, Luther frames the Christian journey as an enduring battle for truth, where each believer is called to stand firm in the face of deception and adversity, anchored in the redemptive work of Christ. In addition, Luther articulates a weighty distinction within Christian theology between two types of righteousness the active righteousness derived from human actions and adherence to laws, and the passive righteousness, which he identifies as the righteousness of faith or Christian righteousness. Active righteousness is grounded in the observance of societal, ceremonial and divine laws, achievable through human effort or as a divine gift akin to other virtuous acts. In contrast, passive righteousness is characterized by a fundamental departure from human works, it is a divine grace bestowed upon individuals through faith in Christ, independent of their deeds. Luther posits that this passive righteousness is not only superior but fundamentally different from all forms of active righteousness. It represents a state of receiving, 
wherein the individual contributes nothing but rather allows God to effect transformation within. This concept of righteousness, according to Luther, is a mystery that remains elusive to the world and even to Christians, necessitating diligent teaching and practice, particularly crucial during trials and temptations. In moments of weakness and sin, Luther observes, humans naturally gravitate towards evaluating their worthiness based on their works, neglecting the solace offered by passive righteousness. This inclination towards self-reliance exacerbated by satanic manipulation leads to despair, overlooking the redemption freely offered through Christ. Luther advocates for a steadfast embrace of this passive righteousness, a relinquishment of self-derived and law-based righteousness in favor of the grace, mercy, and forgiveness encapsulated in Christ's righteousness. This paradigm shift from active striving to passive receiving underpins Luther's prescription for overcoming despair and securing salvation, highlighting a foundational tenet of his theological discourse. Further, Luther presents a profound insight into the nature of righteousness and the role of the law in Christian life. He draws a vivid analogy between the earth's incapacity to generate rain and mankind's inability to attain heavenly righteousness through their own efforts. Luther indicates that just as the earth receives rain through the grace of God, so too is heavenly righteousness bestowed upon humans, not by their deeds or merits, but through the divine generosity of God. This comparison maintains the essential truth that human endeavors alone are insufficient for securing eternal righteousness. It is a gift that must be granted by God. Luther advances this argument by distinguishing between two types of righteousness. The earthly or active righteousness, which involves adherence to the law and the performance of good works, and the heavenly or passive righteousness, which is received through faith in Christ and God's mercy. He disputes that the greatest wisdom for a Christian is to understand the limitations of the law and active righteousness, especially when facing God's judgment. For Luther, true salvation lies in embracing the passive righteousness that comes from God, which necessitates a deliberate ignorance of the law and a reliance on divine grace and mercy through faith in Christ. Besides, he argues that the law, while necessary for societal order and the restraint of sin, ultimately serves to reveal human sinfulness and cannot justify humans before God. Luther calls for a balanced teaching that rightly divides the word of God, applying the law to the old man, the sinful nature, and the gospel of grace to the new man, the regenerated spirit. This discernment between law and grace, active and passive righteousness, is crucial for understanding Christian doctrine and living a life of faith that leads to salvation. Luther's theology thus advocates for a Christian life centered on faith in Christ's redemptive work, rather than on personal merit or adherence to the law. Additionally, Luther articulates a deep theological distinction between two forms of righteousness, the earthly righteousness derived from adherence to the law and the heavenly righteousness bestowed through faith in Christ. This delineation is central to his rebuttal against the accusations from the papacy, which, according to Luther, misinterprets his views on good works by confining their understanding to the law's righteousness. Luther employs the metaphor of two worlds to clarify this distinction, the earthly realm governed by laws and deeds and the heavenly realm, where righteousness is a divine gift received through faith, not works. Luther contends that the righteousness of the law is inherently limited, as it pertains to earthly matters and is incapable of achieving divine grace or salvation. He likens this to the earth's inability to produce fruit without the heaven's nourishment, pointing out that true righteousness and fulfillment of the law cannot be attained through human deeds alone, but require the intervention of Christ's righteousness. This heavenly righteousness is characterized as passive, a gift that believers accept by faith, elevating them above the constraints of the law and enabling a direct relationship with the divine. In Luther's view, this divine righteousness absolves believers from sin, guilt and the fear of death, offering instead joy, peace and eternal life. He debates that this state of grace is a testament to the power of faith in Christ, who serves as a mediator and redeemer, liberating believers from the law's demands. Through this framework, Luther defends the significance of faith and grace in Christian life, challenging the notion that salvation can be earned through works alone. His discourse reiterates the transformative power of Christ's righteousness, 
advocating for a spiritual life rooted in faith, grace, and the promise of eternal salvation. Also, Luther explores the stark dichotomy between two forms of righteousness, the righteousness derived from adherence to the law, active righteousness, and the righteousness obtained through faith in Christ, passive righteousness. He articulates that our earthly existence is characterized by a dualistic struggle where the flesh is burdened by the law's demands and its resultant guilt, yet the spirit finds dominion and joy in the grace bestowed by Christ's righteousness. This grace signifies the believer's assurance of salvation, anchored in the victory of Christ over sin, death, and the law, a victory celebrated in the heavens. Luther repeats the critical nature of understanding and embracing passive righteousness as the cornerstone of Christian doctrine. He posits that straying from this principle equates to losing the essence of Christianity, leading individuals towards a reliance on their deeds for salvation. This misstep categorizes them with other faiths and sects that do not hold this central Christian tenet, illustrating a binary with no middle ground between legalistic righteousness and the transformative righteousness of Christ. He critiques those leaders and sects who, despite using the language of grace, fail to truly comprehend or convey its depth, remaining shackled to a legalistic view of righteousness. These individuals Luther disputes are merely rebranding old practices under new names without experiencing the heart change that faith in Christ brings. Luther urgently calls for the constant affirmation and teaching of faith-based righteousness to ensure the church's foundation and growth in this truth. He warns of the ease with which one can verbally distinguish between legalistic and faith-based righteousness, yet how challenging it can be to apply and experience this distinction in real life, especially in moments of spiritual crisis. This distinction, Luther underlines, is essential for maintaining the purity of Christian doctrine and the comfort it provides to believers, underscoring the necessity of steadfast faith in Christ's righteousness alone for true salvation. Last but not least, Luther passionately advocates for a deep understanding of the crucial distinction between law and grace, emphasizing the vital importance of this differentiation for both spiritual leaders and individual believers. He warns of the devil's schemes which exploit the law to induce fear, guilt and despair during times of spiritual trial, aiming to sever the believer's connection with Christ. Luther accentuates that the devil may even distort the gospel's message, presenting Christ as a mere lawgiver rather than the Savior, to ensnare believers into a works-based righteousness that leads to despair. Luther's exhortation extends to the diligent practice of engaging with Scripture through study, meditation and prayer, preparing believers to navigate these spiritual battles. He articulates a clear division between active righteousness based on our works and passive righteousness, received through faith in Christ. This passive righteousness, Luther argues, should reign supreme in the believer's conscience, safeguarding it against the law's encroachment and the ensuing despair. By firmly anchoring our righteousness in Christ's work, believers are liberated to perform good deeds, not out of fear or obligation, but from a place of love and gratitude. This transformative understanding influences all aspects of life, encouraging believers to live out their faith across various roles in society, be it as ministers, householders, or servants, each act reflecting the will of God and the love of Christ. Luther's teachings serve as a bulwark against the false doctrines that had clouded the true essence of faith among the Galatians, championing the gospel's purity and the believer's freedom in Christ. He positions the gospel as the bedrock of Christian assurance, fostering a life of joyful obedience and service, underpinned by the serious truth of salvation through faith alone. In conclusion, Watson's examination of Martin Luther's commentary on the Epistle to the Galatians offers a deep dive into one of the hallmark texts underpinning the Protestant Reformation, revealing both its historical context and enduring theological significance. Luther initially delivered these groundbreaking lectures at the University of Wittenberg in 1531, which, through the dedicated efforts of his contemporaries, notably George Rohrer, Veit Dietrich and Caspar Krusiger, were meticulously transcribed and later published in 1535. This team effort was instrumental in ensuring Luther's oral presentations were accurately captured, preserving his dynamic insights into the nature of faith and justification by faith alone, central tenets of Protestant belief. Moreover, the translation of Luther's commentary into English begun in 1575, 
demonstrates the translator's commitment to retaining the essence of Luther's theology while grappling with the challenges inherent in rendering his complex Latin into English. Watson affirms how the translator's work was influenced by their own theological leanings, notably Zwinglian sympathies which led to subtle omissions and edits, especially concerning sacramental doctrine where Luther's views diverged sharply from Zwingli's. Furthermore, Watson examines Luther's motivations for focusing on Galatians, asserting Luther's intent to provide a robust defense of the doctrine of justification by faith against the backdrop of theological challenges from both radical reformers and traditional scholastic theology. Luther's engagement with Galatians was marked by his critical stance against both groups, advocating for a faith that harmonized personal spiritual experiences with established ecclesiastical practices. Through Watson's analysis, the commentary's journey from a series of academic lectures to a foundational text of Protestant theology illuminates the collective endeavor to preserve and propagate Luther's seminal theological insights. This work not only transformed religious scholarship and practice in its era, but has continued to shape the contours of Christian belief and understanding through subsequent generations. Watson's exploration of Luther's commentary on Galatians provides a window into the theological ferment of the Reformation, showcasing Luther's thorough impact on the development of Protestant doctrine and his enduring legacy in Christian theology.